Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Social Media and Politics Podcast, bringing you expert insights into how social media is changing the political game. I'm your host, Michael Bassetta, Assistant Professor of Communication and Media at Lund University. Remember, you can follow the show on Twitter at SMNP Podcast or visit us on the web at socialmediaandpolitics.org. All right, y'all. Thanks so much for tuning in. In this episode, we're going to be focusing on political party communication using social media data and looking at it in both a comparative and longitudinal fashion. So comparative meaning comparing party communications across different country contexts, and then longitudinal basically meaning time series analysis and looking at this data over time. And my guest today is Professor Anders Olaf Larsen. He's a professor of communication at Christiania University College in Norway, and Professor Larsen's research very much tries to take this comparative approach and looking at social media data over time. So as we'll kind of discuss in the episode, we know this data is imperfect. The question is, how do we still generate meaningful insights from this rather poor quality data, or in other words, turning uh, lemons into lemonade? And one way to do that is to look beyond just one isolated case study and try to infer more broad generalizations about party communication on social media. So in this episode, we're going to touch on like five or six of Professor Larson's studies. So I'm not going to read them out all here, but you'll find links to them in the episode description. We start off by talking broadly about party communication in Europe, where Professor Larson has compared 225 countries since they started posting on Facebook and Instagram and comparing between um, so-called populist parties parties and non-populist parties and finding that these parties that experts label as populist tend to receive more engagement and we speculate for why that might be. Then we move into talking about the Nordics or more specifically Scandinavian countries where Professor Larson has done a lot of research and in particular drilling into Norwegian data and two studies that Professor Larson has done, one comparing the hashtag networks of Twitter and Instagram, which is really interesting because it hasn't really been done so much from the Instagram side. And then lastly, we'll look at what type of posts seem to go viral in Norway and how that stacks up across platforms. So definitely a lot of research covered in this episode. I think if you're a practitioner, there are a few tips for how to drive engagement potentially by marketing sweaters, but more on that as we dive into the episode. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Anders Olaf Larsen. Again, he is a professor of communication at Christiania University College. Professor Larson, thanks for taking the time out. Welcome to the Social Media and Politics Podcast. Thank you very much. So I thought we could start out here with a discussion of digital political communication in Europe, where it's sometimes difficult to get a broad overview due to the diversity of the continent. Yet you've been conducting research on how European parties have been using Facebook and Instagram since they started. So before diving into that in more detail, what's your interest in studying party communication in Europe? Is there something we can learn from European parties that might not be available in other contexts? So, as you know, and probably as a lot of the listeners of this podcast know, there are a lot of research and a lot of studies looking into individual elections in specific countries, but there's there's not a lot of work comparing elections or indeed looking at the periods in between elections when, well, essentially when there's no heightened period of political interest. And so it seems to me, and it, it has indeed seemed to me over the last few years, that a lot of studies have pointed out that more comparative work of this nature is needed. And so that's what I've been trying to do over the last maybe five or six years. And of course, with a diverse continent, like you said, like Europe, it's not necessarily an easy task um, because obviously with X number of countries and X number of political systems and different traditions within each country, how do you do this? So what I've essentially tried to do is to simplify or streamline or uh, I guess you could also say dumb it down a bit, right? You simplify in order to be able to say something more general, but rather overarching and to show the tendencies that goes on in this particular region of the world. And so for the for the studies that I believe that you were thinking of in your in your question, I'm guessing uh, you're referring to uh, two pieces that were somewhat recently out in New Media Society. One of them is... Um, the rise of Instagram as a tool for political communication, uh, 
and the other one I call Picture Perfect Populism, which essentially does the same for Facebook. I tried to make this interesting um, by looking at the issue of populism, and um, I leaned on previous research who had defined the parties as populists or not, uh, and then tried to compare the activities of these parties across Europe. Yeah. And I mean, I remember uh, looking at those papers and there'll be links down in the uh, the episode description. I mean, you built a, a data set of like, how many was it? 280 parties or something across Europe? You know what? I, do, I don't have the exact number, but probably something like that. I, I basically went with the um, the official web pages of the parliament in each country and then tried to find based on the official web pages of each party in each country tried to find the official accounts and then worked from there to create a data set that, then, uh, that contained all the posts. So uh, yeah, 280 sounds insane enough that that would be <laughs> the, the number that I that I used. Yeah. So in tracing these parties' activity or over time, as you said, it, it, it kind of requires some generalization because we lose context about the specifics of each you know individual year or each individual country. I mean, what were the kind of key takeaways from those studies on Facebook and Instagram? So I suspect that when I started looking into these things that I would see a heightened level of popularity in terms of being engaged with on Facebook and Instagram for the populist parties. But I didn't expect this heightened level to be so very dominant in compared to the non-populist parties, because what we can see is rather impressive, if we can put it like that, levels of engagement received by parties that have been classified as populist compared to parties that were classified as non-populists. The levels of engagement that they enjoyed uh, was a bit of a surprise to me that that there was quite a large difference between the two different types of parties. Mm. And I think that's something that even more isolated case studies have found, like, okay, that it might be the anger that leads to more engagement, or maybe it's that populists need social media because they don't get covered in the mainstream press. I mean, do you have any speculation about why they might be getting this higher level of engagement? No, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, there's a there's a certain emotional aspect to some of the posts that enjoy particularly high amounts of engagement. And this is not something that I touch upon in, in these particular papers that we started out discussing, but I've looked at this in other uh, studies that um, I guess we'll get back to later also. Um, there's a sense of urgency there's a sense of almost like a panic. Uh, things are happening to our country. We need to do something about it. And there's a lot of all caps <laughs> involved and uh, uh, exclamation points and things like that to, to sort of really hammer down the point that this is something very urgent that we need to take care of. Definitely. And so, you know, I'd, I'd like to the kind of theme I have for this episode is to kind of start broad with Europe and then funnel down into more specific cases. And kind of before we get to the more individual Nordic countries, I thought we'd start with the the Nordic region where you've done a lot of research, particularly in Norway and Sweden. And clearly from the outside, the Nordics are often grouped together as sharing similar political systems and cultures. In your view, are there also some similarities in digital communication that are specific to or shared by Nordic parties? I, I guess I would I would be more comfortable talking about Scandinavia rather than the Nordics because I haven't looked into Finland and Iceland so much. Of course, I hope to do so in the future because pending a decision from the Norwegian Research Council, we will be able to do some sort of big comparative project between all the, the, the Nordic countries. Fingers crossed. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, but yes, if you look at the structural factors with the three Scandinavian countries and in particular then for Sweden and Norway, where I've done most of my research being a native Sweden and uh, now living in Norway, this came sort of natural to me. Indeed, there are a lot of similarities. There's uh, high levels of internet use, high levels of social media use, high voting rates. But there are also some key differences that um, make them interesting to study in this regard. I have to confess, I'm not sure about Iceland, but I do know that Denmark, Norway and Finland, they separate their elections. So you'll have separate dates for local and regional elections. These will be separate from national elections. Whereas in Sweden, all of the elections, local, regional, national, are held on the same day every fourth year. Whereas in Norway, for instance, it's every other year there's an election. It's either for the local, regional or for the uh, national parliament. 
So this sort of splits up the attention, which from a democratic perspective seems like a very good way of organizing things. Um, and also, I guess, races, um, not being a political scientist, I don't want to swear about this, but it seems to me that this will raise the political awareness in, in countries that split this up. That's a big difference, I think. Yeah, it's interesting. I th- what jumped out at me was and something we often forget is that high turnout rate among the Nordic uh, countries or Scandinavian countries. And I mean, so it's it's it doesn't seem like in the U.S. where social media is seen as this big, you know, get out the vote or mobilization initiative because 85 percent of the population is already going to vote. So um, I wonder then. You know, is there any strategic differences you've seen? Because one of the interpretations is that European parties in general are kind of slow to adopt social media. They're more cautious and, and risk averse and these types of things. Um, but in the, in the case studies you've looked at, have you seen any outliers where a specific party leverages a platform for a kind of novel mode of campaigning? So I did, um, given my interest in looking at things not only in a comparative fashion, like I discussed in the beginning of our chat, I also think it's interesting to look at things over time, like how things have developed over time in in longitudinal ways. So in a study that was recently published in um, Information, Communication and Society, which um, it's called uh, Win a Sweater with the Prime Minister's Face on It. So that sort of gives away a little bit what it's about. What I did was I looked at the ways in which Norwegian political parties make use of what um, Jenny Stromer Galli, for instance, calls controlled interactivity, which I think is a nice take on the ways in which that political parties, not only in the US but also elsewhere, have tried to shape their online practices, like social media presences and things like that, to make potential voters feel as if they're interacting with the political actor in a more profound and reciprocal way than perhaps is often the case, so as to make them, I guess, more friendly towards the the political actor. And so I did this for Norwegian political parties and party leaders over, uh, I think it was like a 10-year period, and some interesting patterns came up. Now, as the title of the paper suggests, there were a lot of raffles. So you can tag a friend in your post, in this post, and you can win a T-shirt with former Prime Minister Anna Solberg's cartoon face on it, right? There was uh, examples of Christmas calendars, uh, Easter mysteries, which is a very Norwegian thing. Like every Easter, there's a, like riddles to be solved and you can win different party uh, merchandise, right? And this works. This kind of content works in the sense that it becomes very engaged with and it becomes very commented. And also it becomes engaged with to a degree that uh, content posted during elections will not reach these these same levels of engagement. So they're using, of course, they're using these pages and these social media channels for other purposes as well. But it's striking, and I don't think I've seen this in any other country. I've perhaps a little bit in Sweden, but I'm not aware of any other country where where I've seen parties making making use of channels in a sort of a competition, almost like a gamification of of what they're doing. And I know you've done some research on gamification of political campaigning, but this is sort of a, in another way, like they're presenting politics as a game uh, where you can win uh, merch. And so it's a very safe way, I guess, to use these channels rather than asking for, you know, what's your opinion about this particular topic or what are your thoughts about what we should prioritize during this particular campaign? The parties tend to, um, you know, What's the name of the uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs in Norway? And then there's a picture of this particular minister. If you guess right, you can win a tote bag with the Conservative Party <laughs> logo on it, right? It's just this this sort of silliness that, that sticks out. Now, I have to ask about winning a, a sweater in Norway. Is it that... Cause to some, I mean, Norwegian sweaters are a thing, right? But <laughs> yeah. from, the out, from the outside... It would seem that Norwegians wouldn't actually be so into Norwegian sweaters because that's what they have. But does that actually work? Oh, I, I see what you're talking about. You're talking about the one with the specific patterns, right? The knitted yeah. sweater. Yeah, yeah. So this is Norwegian sweater is a thing. Yeah, yeah. This this is more like the sweater is in itself. It's 
orange and there's a picture that's like a cartoon picture of a former conservative party prime minister Anna Solberg on it. So it doesn't have any Norwegian-ness to it in terms of its design other than the fact that there's the, the former prime minister featured as a design. So it's not Norwegian in the sense that it's knitted in what what they call the Marius patterns, right? There's different patterns from different parts of the country. But it's a uh, it, it looks like your standardized political merch. Gotcha. Yeah, because I mean, I, you know, another thing, particularly about European parties, is that they're often capped in terms of how much they can spend during their campaigning. And so it seems like, I mean, I mean, your study finds this, and definitely we've seen it other places where whether it's you know a, a party or an organization, contests are just such a powerful way to get engagement. You spend, you know, how much does it cost to produce this sweater? Um, do you think that's some way, perhaps, to get around some of these campaign spending limits? I know it's a bit of a jump, but I mean, this merch is cheap and the engagement is high. So it seems like it's a it's a good strategy for European parties. You know what? I think that's a very astute observation. You're probably absolutely right. Um, there are indeed limits as to how much money can be spent on these kinds of things. And uh, I mean, the numbers are pretty convincing in my in my mind, at least. You see that the kinds of posts that they receive more attention for tend to be these kinds of posts where you can tag a friend who likes to sleep in in the morning and win pajamas with the <laughs> logo type of so so these kinds of things, they work, right, from the perspective of getting engagement. But the question is, is this the way that political parties should, from, I guess, a normative point of view, is this the way that political parties should communicate with their voters and try to engage their voters with like silly games to win uh, sweaters or T-shirts or tote bags? Uh, short run, yes, because it gives them a lot of attention. But long run, what does it do to the ways in which we think about politics and the ways in the, the demands, I guess you can say, that are placed on people who are put to task to create a campaign for a political actor. How much uh, silliness, <laughs> <laughs> it's a technical term, how much silliness can we stand before it just becomes uh, a sweat lottery or a, quite a literal game of politics? Then? Yeah, definitely. No. Interesting question. So far, we've been talking kind of broad level about campaigning. And um, what I'd like to do now is kind of focus on two of your studies. And again, there'll be links down in the episode description um, that focus really on social media data in the context of Norwegian elections. And I think these studies are, are really interesting because they're comparative in very interesting ways. So one of them deals with comparing hashtag networks across Twitter and Instagram and another one looks at uh, post virality across four platforms. But let's take the uh, the hashtag study first, where you plotted out election hashtag networks across Twitter and Instagram. And I think it's interesting because, of course, both platforms have hashtags, but I don't know of many studies that actually compare them across Twitter and Instagram. So could you give us a short introduction into that study and in particular why you decided to focus on network structures through hashtags around elections? Yeah, sure. The basis for this also, again, goes back to my my idea to try to incorporate different types of comparative aspects into the work that I do. And in this particular study, I guess this is the coherent clusters or fuzzy zones paper that you're referring to. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> in this particular study, I, I was particularly pleased with myself, if I may say so, that I included, <laughs> that, I, that I managed to get like a double comparative uh, aspect into this because I'm looking, like you said, at both Twitter and Instagram, and also across two elections. So yes, why focus on network structures? So hashtags, of course, as you know, is their thematic keywords included by users who want their content to be seen in a specific context. And uh, hashtag-based approaches have been used for a long time, um, but the obvious flaw of this approach is that we can't really be sure that we're collecting everything that's relevant to the discussion. Um, and so with the possibilities we have today with the Twitter Academic API, uh, we could probably do a better job. I could probably do a better job at gauging public discussion in these platforms, given that essentially everything that's ever been posted on Twitter is available. That's a bit of a simplification, but still, it's it's more accessible than it has ever been. Instagram, of course, is another story. Anyways, I'd like to think that the paper you're referring to and the approaches that I took uh, reflect what was going on in the field of social media research at the time. 
So uh, the idea then being to trace public discussion about these elections uh, on these two platforms. And of course, Twitter in Norway and indeed in Scandinavia has often been pointed to as this sort of platform for the chattering classes, right? The people who, who already have positions in society tend to gravitate towards Twitter, whereas Instagram is largely seen as a platform for comparably younger people and not necessarily a focus on discussion and political issues. Right. And I think I should clarify that those two elections were the 2013 and the 2017 Norwegian election. So kind of catching the rise and adoption of Instagram in Norway. But I really like this table in the paper where you compare these two types of structures. You mentioned them before, these fuzzy zones and the clusters, as well as two types of attention, which were centralized and decentralized. And so could you kind of outline those concepts for us and Perhaps for our listeners that are not familiar with social network analysis, can you explain how visualizing these networks can help study these clusters and fuzzy zones? So visuals on the radio, that's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> but, but let's see. You said you're going to link to the paper, so probably people who are interested in this can check out the paper afterwards. So I used um, an application called Gephi. Um, I'm not sure how that is pronounced, but I know it's a, it's a team of French programmers who are behind it, so probably something like that, Gephi, which um, then allows for creation of network visualizations. And the ways that I usually do this is by representing each account that had used the specific hashtag, in this case then related to the two elections, that had used the hashtags or had been mentioned in a tweet or indeed Instagram post using the hashtags as nodes or as circles in the image that is created. And so the bigger each node, the more mentions they had received, uh, what is often referred to as in-degree measurement. So the bigger the node, the more popular you are, the more mentioned you are. And usually in previous work that I've done with Gephi, color of the nodes would signal out-degree or a representation of the number of tweets or Instagram mentions uh, that you had sent to some other users. Usually I did this as if the node representing you is comparably big and deeper in red color, you were uh, both popular because of the size and you were also active because of the color of your corresponding node. But here uh, I used color to represent what is referred to as modularity class, which is sort of an algorithm that calculates the degree to which different nodes belong to each other based on who they mention. So based on shared links to the same nodes. And given these guidelines, we can we can talk of attention giving then as being more centralized, which is what I discussed in the paper, or more decentralized. So for, for centralized attention giving, uh, attention by means of the at character emerges as more concentrated to relatively fewer nodes, thus much larger nodes, dominating essentially the attention giving game within the specific hashtag. Whereas in a decentralized setting, a relative multitude of smaller nodes would suggest more evenly distributed attention giving. Tweets are sent to more users. More users are involved in the discussion. And so for the, for the structure of the network, how the nodes are placed in relation to each other uh, in proximity or relatively far away is dependent then on what other nodes they are referring to or what other nodes they tend to gravitate towards. So as to get areas of the network chart where you can see people sort of keeping to themselves in their own group or whether it's spread out. So I indicated this by use of colors, as mentioned previously. And the idea was to see then if users are mainly discussing within a closer knit group or if the communication could be considered as more widespread over a series of groups of users. And so in the graphs, are we seeing overlapping groups of users indicating attention being given across groups, for instance, political parties discussing either by themselves, supporters of political parties discussing either by themselves, or are we seeing these political party supporter groups overlap with each other? And this then leads to zones based on previous suggestions by research where what kind of names could be useful for this. So I use zones to refer to overlapping groups and clusters to refer to more delimited structures. So a bit complicated perhaps, but hopefully when you see the image, it's clearer, hopefully. 
Yeah, definitely. Because when you, you see the images, it's basically looking to see whether the conversation and the attention is concentrated around some key actors, or is it kind of dispersed in this decentralized um, way. But looking at it across two election cycles, I think shows some quite interesting findings, particularly relating to like Twitter and Instagram in the Norwegian context. So kind of what were the, the key findings there? So what I found in this particular study was that Twitter essentially then developed from what I refer to as decentralized zones, which then means the attention to specific users in this particular hashtag was characterized by overlapping groups of users. So there was discussion going on between uh, most likely what we can refer to as ideological camps, like social democrats and the conservatives. They were overlapping in terms of discussing with each other. Whereas four years later, in 2017, we see uh, centralized zones where fewer users are receiving attentions. And if you look at this particular graph, and if you're sort of familiar with Norwegian political uh, life, you see that the nodes that are the largest, uh, which means then that they have received the most attention, uh, they are nodes representing political parties and political leaders. So we moved from a situation in 2013 where discussion was more spread out and more people were involved and more people were given attention to a situation in 2017 where fewer people appear to be involved and fewer people get more attention. And those people who get more attention are indeed then people who are already sort of situated in the public sphere at the moment. And I think at a broad level, too, it kind of points to there was like a drop in activity on Twitter, which kind of seemingly suggested that, you know, it was kind of phasing, maybe not entirely phasing out, but less popular, whereas Instagram had uh, quite a few more users, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I don't have the numbers in front of me right now, but but this is, I mean, this goes in general for political campaigning. I think we've seen in, in, in Scandinavia, at least, a move away from Twitter. And indeed, um, there's some data that I'm working on right now, which, which I haven't obviously published yet, but it, it suggests that, uh, I'll just uh, leeway into that for a minute. It suggests that political parties are steering users away from Twitter uh, because they're, they're, at least in my in my definition of it, over time, we can see a decrease of hashtag use by political parties and political leaders, which to me is a way, like if you're including a hashtag, you want people to follow a discussion on a specific platform, right? And so that could be seen as an inward facing functionality. But we see those types of things. We see hashtags going down, whereas uh, URLs, the inclusion of URLs in tweets are increasing. And so URLs, obviously, um, when you post a URL, you want someone to follow this URL, to go to this particular link. And so with the increase of URLs and the decrease of hashtags, this says to me that, you know, they're trying to steer people away from Twitter to go to other platforms, to other, to other parts of the Internet. That's interesting. Well, we'll see. I hope to be able to finish it rather soon. <laughs> so we'll see what happens once it's out in the world. Very cool. And I mean, thinking about both the the social network analysis we've been talking about, but also this this new data, I mean, what do you think this says about the kind of publicness of platforms as it comes to hashtags? Because the whole idea, at least originally, of the hashtag was to create this kind of, you know, index conversations for public discussion. But in the first study we were discussing, you were saying that at least on Twitter, the conversation went from kind of dispersed and decentralized to more centralized. And then now you're saying that data indicates that parties may be pushing people away from Twitter. So what do you think all of this means for the kind of original idea of the hashtag and, and, and what social media can mean for civic discourse? So there was a there was a piece in the Norwegian newspaper Aftenposten, which is a, sort of like a, a big daily in, in Norway, a couple of years ago, where the headline read something like I'm translating in my head, right? here are 10 Facebook debaters to follow. And this, to me, says something about this development, that we're moving away from an encouragement to actually engage in a meaningful way with discussion, uh, sort of like what I was discussing previously with the uh, sweater raffle, right? So rather than asking for engagement, uh, you're being asked to follow and to watch as uh, people who already have access to 
the public sphere, if you will, uh, debate with each other. So, and these, are, I mean, these are anecdotal evidences, obviously, but to me, it sort of plays into the same overarching picture of my steadily growing skepticism towards this sort of techno optimism that can be seen in a lot of early work on internet and political communication, social media and political communication, and which indeed relates back to the broader history of communication. Like the railway will tie together countries and increase cultural understanding in ways that will, you know, will never have a war again, right? Uh, radio will increase cultural understanding across borders and television, of course, will make everyone nice and very understanding of what goes on across the world, which is, you know, that did not happen. <laughs> and so, uh, granted, while there were some examples in the Scandinavian context of people outside the chattering classes making their voices heard, I would argue that those examples are very few and far between, and that they were propelled to, I guess, semi-fame by being featured in established media outlets. Like I'm, uh, it's a couple of examples of people who managed to make sort of a splash on Twitter using specific hashtags during specific elections. And then they were sort of featured in the, the tabloids. Uh, but of course they disappear. And so what, in my view, what we're seeing now is the concentration of of use and attention to those who already had positions in the public sphere and essentially then try to move away from a channel which allows for more openness and more discussion and more interaction. Yeah, that, that centralization in action, yes. basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and just to put another anecdote from outside of politics, I saw recently, just the other day, um, there was some news article about the Rolling Stone magazine had a like YouTube creator on there. And it was the first kind of like non-musician, <laughs> you know, the first time they put a, a, a normal person on there. But that person is kind of an influencer elite. So I, I think you're right that there is some kind of concentration going on and of course, there's some kind of normal, quote unquote, normal people that are becoming influencers, but then the, the attention is kind of concentrating around them rather than the kind of average user. And let me just add to this also, I haven't studied this in detail, but it seems to me, again, anecdotally, and um, I think there's some empirical work doing on this, that Twitter is taking a turn for the worse in terms of political discussion in, in Scandinavia and particularly in Sweden. Ridicule, slander, hate speech, even at the hands of elected officials, right? There was an example last week where a representative for the Conservative Party in Sweden, Hanif Bali, posted a racist cartoon of a political opponent, which is, uh, you know, it, it's just unnecessary, it's sad, and it contributes to a vulgarization of political debate. And, uh, I mean, you would expect this from the anonymous eggs, you know, on Twitter, right? That they would be, but, but when it's gone that far that elected officials are steering in this direction and they're being allowed to, uh, to do so by the party themselves because they know that this kind of uh, behavior generates attention, right? I think that's a, that's a very sad day for political discussion. But I'm not really surprised because it's I've seen some tendencies over the last couple of years steering in this particular way. Granted, Bali is a, an extreme example of this, but it, but still, I have a feeling that this is like a tip of the iceberg. Mm. Well, that's a sort of nice segue into the, the last study I'd like to discuss, which is on um, post-virality, which is interesting because there's actually not so much research in political communication um, you know, actually looking at this and especially across platforms. So you looked in the 2017 Norwegian election at kind of what went viral on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. But as many of our listeners know, virality is one of these really tricky concepts to define. So how did you go about approaching virality, especially since these platforms have different engagement metrics? For example, YouTube and Instagram kind of lacking a share feature. How do you count what's what's viral? That's a good question. And um, <clears throat> I think I... I've tried throughout my work to take a, I guess you can call it, I, I prefer to call it a pragmatic approach. People might disagree, but um, to sort of work with the data that we can get access to. I mean, it's, it's an imperfect way of approaching things, but then again, every method has its flaws. And um, much like you said, some of these services don't have a share feature, but YouTube and Instagram provide other metrics. And even though we don't know exactly how these metrics play into the visibility of an Instagram post or a YouTube video. We can still 
it still makes sense to me at least to use what is given to us from the platforms, from the scraping procedures or from the APIs to try and gauge what becomes more engaged with. And so that's what I've done. Uh, and I think for the for the paper you're referring to, which is, I believe, winning and losing, which is, is from convergence, I think, I, I map this out in a sort of a visual way, uh, which is, I guess, reminiscent of the network graphs that we discussed previously, but in order to sort of show, okay, what are the characteristics of the posts that get more engaged with? And then um, the argument then being that if, if these posts are, engaged with to uh, higher degrees, this most likely has an influence over the uh, viral nature of these posts, although we can't be precisely sure exactly to what degree engagement plays into the virality of the posts. Yeah. And I mean, in comparing, you know, what these kind of top performers of the viral posts, um, you know, specifically in this Norwegian context where you know the case very well, I mean, was there some kind of underlying thread through all of these that made them viral or was there something, you know, is it just kind of a random scattershot of posts that go viral and we really don't know why? So uh, there were some differences uh, across the platforms. Um, and uh, <clears throat> some of these are very similar with Sweden as well. And I imagine also with Denmark. But if we start with the Norwegian case, like I did, Facebook is dominated by the, um, the right-wing populist progress party, which is sort of like the... Um, more like the Danish People's Party in Denmark than the Sweden Democrats in Sweden. It's essentially like a liberal, extreme liberal, I guess you can call them, started from like a tax lowering uh, platform and now later ventured into uh, immigration issues. But they, they tend to be very popular on Facebook, much like Sweden Democrats and uh, Alternative for Sweden tend to dominate like the, uh, the Facebook pages of uh, Swedish politicians. Twitter has more serious characteristics among the highly popular posts. Here we see Norwegian political leaders engage with international issues, indeed use hashtags to provide context uh, in international discussions, retweet international leaders. They're trying to be statesmen-like, they're trying to show that they're part of the world, right? Instagram is very different, uh, where they're trying more to be sort of like funny or personal. Or I should say, and or personal. And if we stick with Instagram for a minute and try to expand that to Sweden, because that's where I found some interesting discrepancies. Again, Instagram in Norway tend to be the kind of things that become popular are, I would say, sort of silly. Uh, with the Conservative Party, Haida, as a good example of this, there's a lot of memes, right? There's a lot of meme uh, type content where uh, prominent the representatives of this particular party are like they're adding captions to the pictures and trying to make it funny, right? Whereas in Sweden, if we look at Instagram posts for, from political leaders, uh, I, I believe when I presented this, I forget where I presented this, but I, I received a, a very interesting comment from, um, and I apologize for the pronunciation, Thierry Giasson, who is at the Université Laval in Quebec. Uh, and he, he suggested that the Swedish data looked like almost like a Kardashianization of Instagram <laughs> politics. Because what we're seeing is that, that the, in particular, the female uh, party leaders in Sweden, they're uh, featured in these pictures, uh, you know, getting out of limousines or posing on what's the name of this famous bridge in Paris? I forget this. There's, a, there's like a famous bridge in Paris where they're posing with their newborn baby or, you know, going to a gala uh, or uh, these kinds of sort of glamour shots that you don't necessarily associate with politicians. Right? So you see a lot of that in Sweden. And uh, not so much of that in Norway among the posts that become popular. Why this is, you know, I I have my ideas, but uh, I nothing that not, that I'm too sure of. I wonder. I think of uh, Sture Plan, you know, this place in oh, yeah, Stockholm, yeah, yeah. and like <laughs> so, there is definitely a division in Sweden between the kind of Stockholm posh elite. A lot of slick back hair is kind of the stereotype uh, as well. So I wonder if that maybe is playing into it a bit. It's clear to me that you're you're acclimatized. <laughs> I've been to Sture Plan a few times. <laughs> um, no, so my my last question for you here is, I mean, kind of. Taking a step back and looking at all the kind of comparative research and longitudinal research you've done over time, 
you know, what's your take? You've mentioned a little bit like, you know, working with the engagement metrics that, that the platforms give us, they're imperfect, all methods have flaws. But I wonder, kind of comparing elections across cycles, I mean, do you think that there are some clearly observable patterns that these engagement metrics can be used for? Or would you say that social media research is kind of doomed, so to say, in producing findings that are sometimes comparable, sometimes not based on the context of any given election? Yes. Uh, so the the study that I'm working on now, like I, that I referred to previously, I think is a good example of trying to see some patterns over time, like the Twitter study that I uh, that I refer to, uh, where you can see URLs increasing and hashtags decreasing, right? But this is, of course, dependent on the access that is given to us by the platforms. That being said, I think social scientists should try to compare things across countries, across elections, across time. Um, also those things that might be or might seem difficult to compare at first sight. Because I my take on this would be that perhaps in later years, in 20, 30 years' time, when we look at this data again, we might see some sort of pattern that makes sense then, but that we could not have seen at first sight. If we think about this, how long have we been studying social media during elections? A little over a decade, like 10, 12 years? And how long have elections been studied in, in themselves? Like 50, 60 years, right? And so I think that there's a point to be, I guess, in it for the long run, try to keep at it. And then in perhaps a few years or even decades, we will be able to say something more overarching and something more showing the tendencies. So short run efforts would be geared towards election studies that take into account the unique features of each election. And then in the long run, I hope to be able to contribute to more insights into how certain aspects of those short run studies might be suitable for comparisons over time between countries, between platforms. So as to do uh, have a plan, so to speak, for the longer, uh, a longer period of time. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see, looking back, maybe uh, 30 years from now, we can have you back on the podcast to take a uh, <laughs> longitudinal look. <laughs> I had this discussion with a with a friend of mine, and uh, she told me she thought I was crazy uh, for planning. Like, okay, so when I'm when I'm sixty five, I'll do this, which is, to be honest, sort of what I'm thinking. Uh, again, twenty five years time, or uh, something like that. I'll look into this again. So, of course, I'll do it every year almost. But the idea then being that when I'm older, I'll be able to say something more definite about what has been going on. But in the meantime, I'll try to show the specifics of each election or each platform across elections in different ways. Absolutely. I look forward to that magnum opus. But No pressure, <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> well, Professor Larson, thanks so much for taking the time out and sharing your insights with us. Hey, no worries. I've just been speaking with Anders Olaf Larson, Professor of Communication at Christiania University College. Remember to check the episode description for links to the studies we discussed in the episode. And that's a wrap for this episode of the Social Media and Politics Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. Next time, I'll be speaking with Professor Andrew Chadwick from Loughborough University and talking about the challenges to challenging everyday misinformation on social media. But until then, I'm your host, Michael Bassetta, signing off from Alma. See you next time.